Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. In the 80s and 90s, legal dramas ruled TV viewing in my household. Liability law and litigation seemed to be where the action was, at least in that genre. And I'm talking about shows like LA Law and later on, of course, Suits came out in in our recent era. But there's some fantastic legal dramas and I've always wondered what it takes to be a successful lawyer. It can't just be great outfits and swanning around with cups of coffee through New York. So today we're going to have a chat to Jamie E. Wright, who's one of the most highly sought after millennial lawyers and crisis communicators based in LA, California. Being at the intersection of law, business, pop politics, Wright has made a name for herself in legal and business circles as an expert in managing multidimensional businesses and clients with keen insight in the law and forward thinking flair. It's got a really illustrious career and I'm only going to have time to touch on some of it, but I'm sure she'll share it with us throughout our conversation. She's an attorney and principal in the J. Wright Law Group, PC Wright, who is licensed to practice law in the state of California, and she graduated from the University of California, Berkeley. While she was at Berkeley, she worked for the mayoral campaign at the former mayor of Berkeley, Tom Bates, and due to her commitment to the campaign and work ethic, she was appointed to the City of Berkeley Peace and Justice Commission at just 19 years of age. After graduating from Berkeley, she attended the University of California Hastings College of the Law, and while at Hastings, she was a member of the negotiations team and won second overall mediator and second overall team in the National Negotiations Competition in Chicago. Additionally, Wright was the president of the Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity and the competition's co-chair of the Western Regional Black Law Students Association, a subdivision of the National Black Law Students Association. She was awarded a scholarship for the American Bar Association business section as well as the Charles Houston Bar Association for her academic excellence. Since then, she's gone on and had a successful career to date, and she's also been the recipient of LA's Most Influential Under 40 Award and the Legacy Award from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Second Supervisional District. Most recently, Jamie was appointed to the Marijuana Task Force, where she's one of three board members who draft regulations for physicians prescribing cannabis, and she currently serves as a secretary to the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Southern California, and chairs the Emerging Leaders Committee, which is comprised of young adults 18 to 35 who are engaged in combating social injustice in communities of colour. Additionally, she was the former chairperson of the Board of Directors for the Inglewood Airport Area Chamber of Commerce and a volunteer lawyer for a collective of minority cannabis growers in South Los Angeles. That is so much and I can't believe you're so young still, Jamie, but welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content, and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech-savvy. There's nothing to download, they just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automatic post-production all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to zen.ai forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z. E N dot A I politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. So let's get started. Were you one of these people that always wanted to be a lawyer? Do you remember your early childhood dream and did that come true? 
<laughs> so ironically, I, I vacillated a little bit. So my dad, who was a disabled vet, used to take me down to the courthouse during the summers and would sit me in the back of the courtroom. And then when I was in undergrad, I thought, oh, my God, I want to be a forensic scientist. Right. And so I was in organic chemistry 3A, which is like the weeder course at UC Berkeley. And I was one of those people who the course weeded out. <laughs> <laughs> so then I got back to my passion and love of the law and got my degree in, in history and a master's in history and, and then ended up in law school. And so that's how I got to where I am today in terms of being in the law. I did deviate for a while, though. Excellent. So the most common type of liability lawsuit that I'm aware of is where you stand to lose assets in resulting from one from, say, an accident, according to an article which I came across as prepping for our uh, conversation today. Obviously, your work is more than the art of, and I'm doing air quotes here, ambulance chasing. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you do in a typical day? Sure. So my practice is comprised of not only personal injury cases, but a big chunk of my practice is employment law. And what I mean by that is wrongful termination, retaliation, discrimination based on some protected class, protected class meaning race, gender, a disability, things of that nature, and then failure to provide proper wages. And then there's your breach of contract actions. And so that all kind of encompasses this idea of liability and what your exposure might be if you are a company or you're an individual that's been sued. So liability has a much broader scope that things fall under than just kind of the ambulance chasers. And it's so funny that you say that because that's a topic <laughs> that I've been hearing a lot in my circles because people are very frustrated by the ambulance chasers and they feel like they're really starting to aggressively bring down the profession. Yeah, absolutely. I guess there's a place. I mean, in Australia, in, in that sort of area, you know, they are they are the legal practices that literally have billboards advertising their services above, you know, major freeways where there's going to be car crashes. I mean, it sounds mm. so macabre, but that's literally what you see. And you think, wow, mm. okay, somebody has to call that person, I guess. So they obviously have a, have a role, but I, I can hear what you're saying about maybe, you know, kind of putting you all in the same basket is, is not quite the right approach. Because mm -mm, some people literally churn and burn their clients and they do everything to just get a couple dollars and they don't really represent their clients um, efficiently. And, you know, recently the state bar has been doing a lot more aggressive, you know, kind of ethics work around that. And so that's going to be something that you're going to probably see a lot more of the state bar regulating, particularly plaintiffs lawyers in California about their fees and trying to figure out how to reduce the fees that that they get. Absolutely. So quite simply, liability means legal responsibility for one's actions and failure to meet this responsibility leaves a person open to a liability lawsuit for any resulting damages. Right. In order to win that lawsuit, the claimant must prove that the accused party is liable. That's my understanding anyway. So what role does this liability law piece of the pie, if you like, play in, in perhaps your legal practice and other parts of the world? I mean, is it something where it's, you know, 50% of legal practices have this? Is it something that's kind of seen as more niche and specialised? How would you sort of put it into the context of overall legal practice? Well, I think the term is really broad. I mean, anybody who has done a wrong is exposed to potential liability. And I think that's just the standard answer all across the world. I mean, and how you prove liability is based on um, the causes of action and, and proving the elements. So, you know, if I was to say negligence, there are certain elements that I have to meet in order to prove that the person who hit my vehicle was negligent and then I'm entitled to damages how much the damages are that I'm going to get are going to be defined by, you know, the history of these types of cases. And also yeah. um, the, the, in addition to the history of these types of cases, what your experts say, your expert, meaning your medical doctors and what the treaters say about your future damages. Yeah, absolutely. So during law school, you worked as, as a federal judicial extern for right. the Honourable Martin J. Jenkins United States District Court Northern District, and you held right. internships at a couple of other places. Upon graduation, you joined the ranks of large international law firms specialising in commercial contracts, product liability and labour and employment discrimination litigation. Right. And as an associate, you have counselled Fortune 500 companies and provided that kind of legal advice that we would expect to the firm's clients. What do you think, having sort of had this kind of, you know, cumulative experience in your practice and, you know, obviously prior to that, some of the biggest challenges are that we're facing in 2022 when it comes to liability law? Oh, well, you know, one of the issues that I think a lot of employers are facing because of COVID and the remote work is 
how do you monitor your employees and make sure that they're taking their meals and rest breaks, right? Ah, of course. Um, how do you, yeah, how do you make sure someone is being fairly accommodated from their disability if they're working from home? How do you make sure that, you know, you are complying with the recent law changes regarding your employees? That's where I see the biggest issue coming up for employers. As far as, you know, individuals, I think there's this is challenge that people are facing with, you know, lawsuits that are coming for individuals that they deem to be money hungry. So, you know, somebody may sue you for something small just to get a payout. Um, it's kind of incredible how the law has shifted over the last couple of years. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I can imagine. And I and I suppose, you know, there must be some sort of appetite for that too at the other end. You know, there's got to be some sort of, I guess, reason why it's allowed or facilitated. And I'd be, I'd be curious to know, you know, from your perspective, if it's something that ethically there are some sort of frameworks around. <laughs> That's a great question. So there is an appetite for it. Um, I think you referenced them earlier with ambulance chasers. There's a lot of those kinds of shops that have been popping up of people who are looking at these large dollar, dollar settlements and large dollar verdicts and going, oh, I can go get one of those too. A lot of times there are claims that are absolutely drummed up that aren't real. And the idea is, even if there really isn't any kind of discrimination or you know wrongful termination, let's make it up. That way, we would rather get the defendant to offer us the amount that they may spend on their attorney as opposed to spending attorney's fees. We could get that money for this client. And yeah. so there is some of that and quite a bit of it, actually. Absolutely. So what aptitudes do you think make a great lawyer, particularly in this liability practice area? I mean, obviously, you've got to have an inquiring mind. You have to be intelligent. You have to have great communication skills. You talk about the fact that with what you offer, it's it's more than just being great on the tools, as we say in Australia. You, you must have other things which you think kind of bring bring it all together and make you great at what you do. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you do, right? Like if you are a trial attorney, like and I'm a trial attorney, it's important for you to, to be personable. You have to be able to connect with a jury because you have to be able to advocate for your client based on the law and the facts. Um, I think the other thing is being a great writer, because if you are advocating, part of your advocacy comes in the form of written work. If you are the partner in the firm or you own your own business like I do, you have to be able to network in various amounts of rooms. And when you do that, that's how you get more clients. So it's it's so much more than just understanding the law. There's so many various aspects that go into being uh, what I consider a dynamic attorney. So medicinal cannabis is very mainstream in lots of parts of the world, but not always has been. That's an area of law which I know you're, you're involved with just from, you know, what we discussed in my introduction. And society has become more accepting of the benefits of medicinal cannabis for chronic pain sufferers. What mm. are some of the challenges that area still faces? I mean, there's some conservatism, I think, in parts of America, which would probably still challenge that. I'm, I'm just guessing, just based on what I read and also, you know, our experiences in Australia, we're not homogenous as a society. Yeah, you know, in California, marijuana is legal. <laughs> so that's not really the issue. I think with, with where the bigger issue comes in is there's these marijuana farms and people who are still selling the stuff illegally so it doesn't have to be regulated. Mm. Um, there was a recent bust here in Southern California where somebody had this farm and it was like pounds and pounds and pounds of marijuana that the sheriff caught. And um, the, the, the wildest thing about what happened was the judge let them out on their own recon on bail. And there was, you know, the sheriff was very upset. He was like, this is a crime. But wow. like, how's that possible? The type of district attorney that we have in, in L.A. County, there's there's it's not very punitive these days. Yeah. That's why you see these yeah. high rates of crime. Um, the pendulum has swung a little bit to, you know, being a little bit softer on crime. I think that's the, the yeah. most tactful way I can put that. So that's what happened there. So I think that's what happens is there, even if something's legal, people are still going to find a way to make extra money off it through some market that's a little more black than it is white. Absolutely. I mean, what makes you want to volunteer to actually help some of the, these collectives of the minority cannabis growers? I mean, what's your sort of personal motivation? Is there a story behind that? 
You know, there's a lot of money to be made in the cannabis world. And so for me, helping minorities sort of navigate those options, especially those options in the sense of like, okay, here we are, you know, there's regulations in the city. The city requires you to do this. The county requires you to do that. The state that requires you to do this in order to earn income. And so it's important for people to have access to the resources because it's not very clear how you go about do that, doing that. And oftentimes people of color are on the back end of receiving these opportunities, you know, we're kind of last to the party. So that's why I volunteered to aid them. Yeah, absolutely. So without maybe naming names, what kind of client and work is your absolute favorite and why? What What's the kind of big win in what you do? You know, for me, it is the woman who has been sexually harassed and the small company that is being shook down on a bogus lawsuit. Both of them have a meritorious case. And for me, it's about zealous advocacy and fighting for someone who's being wrong. Because not it's not always the company that's wrong. Sometimes it is a um, greedy plaintiff's lawyer. Sometimes it is a greedy plaintiff. And um, on the other hand, sometimes it's a greedy corporation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that must be very satisfying. Mm-hmm. So what has sort of I guess for the most part, in my experience anyway, and everyone I've spoken to in in this podcast, there's always one or two mentors and sometimes they're formal mentors or sometimes they're family members or sometimes they're just people that they've read about and got inspiration from. Are there one or two that really have helped you and stand out for you and why? You know, it's funny. is People want to mentor me now that I'm more senior in practice. I had mentors in my head, <laughs> um, people that I kind of idolized in the practice. You know, Ruth Bader, Justice, the late Justice Ruth RVG is somebody who I definitely find to be um, authentic and brilliant. Connie Rice is a, is a big time civil rights lawyer who I think is authentic and brilliant. Sean Holly was part of the OJ um, Simpson team back in the 90s, and she's now a hot shot, big time criminal defense entertainment lawyer. Those are some of the people I can think of that in my head are my mentors, but that I don't know. <laughs> I, follow their career path. <laughs> I love that. So if we spoke again in a year's time, Jamie, what would be your number one goal to have achieved and why? To have tried at least three more cases, because trial experience is key And to have really made a mark as being like one of those top go-to attorneys that gets those big verdicts for their clients. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'll circle back to you in a year and see how you've gone with that. (laughs) And it was as we wrap up our conversation today, do you have a final takeaway message for us on the politics of liability law? Any final thoughts? You know, the one thing I would say to anybody who's a business owner that's listening Be mindful of, you know, making sure your insurance is in place, liability insurance is in place in case something happens at your business. And then for an individual who's going into a business, always be very careful and observant of your surroundings when you're walking through a facility. And, you know, just always know that there's options out there. There's attorneys out there that you could speak with and never be afraid if you think you've been wronged to contact someone and just ask the question. Yeah. What is, is there exposure? Absolutely. I think that's fantastic, simple advice that most of us can actually get benefit from. So it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you today, Jamie. And of course, there'll be some contact details on our show notes as always. Until next time, take care. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests so if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.